All right, good morning, everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, right? It's nice to see everybody here. Um, I'll be honest, the sermon, uh, Berlin approached me, I think about three weeks ago, and he asked, he said, well, we've got a few weeks to fill before Pastor Mike's going to be here, so, you know, would you be willing to preach again? And he's like, "Mm -hmm 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 -hmm." sure. So I kind of got to pick the week, which was okay. And uh, so I was sitting there thinking about it, and I was like, God? All right, what am I going to preach on? This was two weeks ago. I went through the week, and I'm like, God, what am I going to preach on? God, I'm waiting. What am I going to preach on? And uh, so I, I have to say an apology to Kevin. And maybe it shouldn't apologize, but last Sunday, he started a sermon, and it hit me. Honestly, it kind of hit me kind of hard. 
And so I'm sitting over there taking notes just as fast as I can. Unfortunately, it wasn't about Kevin's sermon. God was telling me something. So I took about six pages of notes just as quickly as I could write. I was like, okay, God, that's where we're going. So this morning, uh, the passage reading is, you know, it's a parable that just about everybody knows about the prodigal son. A lot of times this sermon is is reserved for Father's Day or some other moment. Um, But, you know, I, I titled this message, The Heart of the Father, because I want us to take a different look at it today. So, prodigal son, um, this Bible parable or story, it, it can really fit to a lot of different facets in life. And I, I do believe it does. I believe it hits on a lot of things um, such as selfishness, grace, mercy, forgiveness, pride even. Uh, there, there's a lot of different contexts within this very short parable. It, it does also include how we as Christians can experience the heart of God by experiencing his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. Now, I'm not going to give you the name of this person right off the bat, but there's a certain person, and he's alive today. He was a rebel. He was a college dropout. He was a drunk. Uh, He was a party boy. He smoked. He, He did everything wrong. He was a brawler. He was in and out of jail. The local police knew him really, really well. By his own admission, he was the characteristic of a prodigal son. But today, he's probably one of the most well-known Christian figures that we have in our society today. His name is Franklin Graham. Most people know his father, for sure, Billy Graham. And you know, his gospel or his, his, his ministry reaches probably millions of people today, whether it's through Samaritan's Purse or by his preaching. But Franklin Graham will tell you that he is where he is today because he had a father who was gracious, merciful, and forgiving. Now, through this message, or through this passage, we not only see the state of the son who goes from self-loving to self-loathing, but also the state of the father who is the ever-strong, the ever-loving, the ever-patient, and the welcoming parent. The behavior of the father when this parable was given in Jesus' time would have actually been very awkward, especially for a son to come and ask for his inheritance and run off and squander all of it and want to come back. If the son had returned in Jesus' time, he would have returned to anger and probably some type of very public punishment. In fact, in reality, the, the village, when he returned home, would probably have actually punished him for the father. And the father would have every right to totally disavow this son. So, the selfish son. When this son left home, he doesn't state in the story that he made any effort to say goodbye. He didn't make any effort to uh, try and smooth things over as he left. In fact, he went away, just decided to burn every bridge he could. Didn't show that he cared at all. All he focused on was what was in his mind. Now, what was in his mind was a lot of selfishness. You know, he, nobody likes a selfish person. In fact, I'd probably venture to say that nobody likes an outwardly selfish person because most people inwardly, there's a little bit there. And, and most people have a little bit of selfishness, sometimes not so bad. Um, but this statement really drove home uh, some of the sermon to me. And it says, what we want, what Excuse me. We want what we want, and sin is born of our willingness to get what we want apart from God. I'll say that one more time. We want what we want, and sin is born of our willingness to get what we want apart from God. In fact, I'd probably go so far as to say it could probably be proven that every sin comes from an act of selfishness. And I think that could probably actually be proven. But notice, in this passage, guess what? The son doesn't want accountability. I'm going to go where people don't know me. Guess what? So I can live the way I want. And nobody can say anything to me at all. He went to a far country, folks. He didn't just go to the village next door. This guy left and he went away. He was gone. Now, in those days, they didn't have a car, right? So (laughs) 
20, 30 miles could be a long ways away, right? So uh, he went away. A lot of us probably actually have battled this at some point in our life. We may not actually leave, but many people have their hidden life that many others don't even see. It's because we don't like accountability. We don't like somebody telling us when we've done something wrong. Being accountable doesn't always allow us to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Some people even leave the church this way. They don't want to be reminded of how they should live. Why would I want to go and sit in front of a preacher and have him instruct me on how God tells me I should live? I don't like that very much. Maybe I don't want to come to church. Maybe I don't want to listen to that. We begin to think that, accountability, that unaccountability actually brings freedom to do what we want. But in reality, it actually leads to the slavery of sin. It says in John 8:34. I tell you the truth, that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, when the son left, he was separated from his father. The son, in asking his father for what he did, especially in those times, would have been looking at his father and saying, why don't you die? Because you not dying right now is keeping me from getting what I want. So I wish you'd either hurry up and die or just cut me what's mine and I'm going to be gone. He didn't care about his father's well-being or how hard the father had actually worked for, quote, his inheritance. Of course, it doesn't take very long for this selfish son to realize that everything is gone and now he's forced to face his reality. Now, this son's reality brought him to a state of humbleness, which I hope it does for everybody. Um, in this son's humbleness, he, he, he had to eat some humble pie in a drastic way. If you'll notice in the verses in the passage, there's not much, there's really not much meat and potatoes to what's stated about what the son did. It says he asked for his inheritance, left, went to far country and squandered it, and now all of a sudden he's feeding pigs, right? There's very little text in that. Uh, the main part of the story doesn't even focus on that. All we know is that he went and he blew it. Now, most of you all know that uh, the Jewish people have some unclean animals, all right? The pig being chiefest of those unclean animals. And so this guy, when Jesus was speaking this parable to the Pharisees, he literally stated that he went and fed pigs, right? He fed pigs. Now, anybody that's raised a pig knows that they're not exactly the cleanest animal ever known to mankind either. So it was going to be a gross, dirty job. It was going to be unclean for him as a Jew. It was going to be unclean for him in a sanitary way and in everything possible. So the Jewish nation or who he was speaking to would definitely not have thought that this was a great thing to do for him to go feed pigs, let alone eat the same food as them. But for this young man, it literally took him being drugged down to the very pit of despair to feed pigs for him to be humbled before God. Honestly, in their nation, there probably would have been nothing lower for him to do. Now, step back just a second. I want you to consider his brief time of riotous living. We can only assume that in that time, he was probably making friends. He probably had everything he wanted to eat. He had plenty of female companionship. He was always staying in the best and nicest of places. And he was staying in the four seasons every night. He was having a great old time. Room service out, uh, you know, just lots of great things. Problem is, selfishness and short-sightedness can be a very lethal combination. And for this young man, it almost was. The real problem, though, with the short-sightedness wasn't just in his plan to leave home. His short-sightedness, as we go on in the passage, actually proves that he didn't see the heart of his father. To say that he didn't plan very well would be a big understatement. This guy was not a money guy, if you know what I'm saying. He did not plan well. Um, But Jesus is trying to get them to see that this son went as low as humanly possible before he actually humbled himself. Being humble before God is something that, I'll be honest, I, I don't know how many people ever get to that point. 
and you may think you've been there, but I would ask you to really self-examine yourself, your person, and just take a look at, have I really been to that point before in my life where I've been humbled before God? And I mean true humble. You've been on your knees before God. God, sorry. Excuse me. James four six says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Just think about it a minute. This prodigal son is in the smelliest, stinkiest, most disgusting place you can imagine. It's dusty, it's hot, mud all around. There's these grunting pigs that you probably don't want to have to deal with anymore. You may have named them Sally, Jeff, and Jim, but guess what? They're not your real friends. He doesn't know when he's going to see clean water ever again. He doesn't know where he's going to sleep that night. He's probably going to sleep right there in the same mess as those pigs. He has no hope of anything getting better. He has a thought in all of this. Just maybe, just maybe, I can go home. How great it would be to go back and even live a fraction of the existence that I had before. How awesome would that be? The son knew what he had to do to return home, or at least he thought he did. He thought he did. He really believed the only way to return home was to be lower than he was before. I'll be a little socially lower. And that day, there was definitely a social class. And he wouldn't be able to return to exactly where he was before, but he had hope. He was thinking, well, maybe I can go back and work for daddy. That would be okay. But if you look closer, what the son was really wanting was salvation by works. He thought, I can work to get back in. I can put in hard-earned effort. I can make it. Now, We're going to take our eyes off of the prodigal son, and we're going to look at the other son for just a moment. Now, the other son is typically what people would think of as the good son. He stayed at home. He worked hard. He helped daddy around the farm, right? He did everything his daddy asked him to do. He looks like the good old boy. And from the verses we see, it says, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. This kid was really upset. Now, a lot of people think he's got the right to be upset. Does he really? Look at me, daddy. Look at what I've done for you. I've never done any of this. I've never done what he did. I've never done this. You hear a common theme in those words. I, 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 pride, selfishness. You also notice that in that passage, he cut down the other son, right? I'm going to put him down and bring up all his faults to make him look bad and make me look even better. You ever done that? You ever use somebody else as the little stepping stool for your own self? Now, this kind of activity, does it remind you of any, does it remind you of anything? Because it should remind you of the first son. The second son, just like the first, didn't realize the heart of the father. For this son, it was just the same. All daddy was, was a means to an end. He was using the father to get what he wanted. Just using him to get ahead. The only difference was they went about it in a totally different way. Now, 
In the case of the second son, or the good son, he had a false humility. He is literally being selfish, but secretly, behind the scenes, behind everybody's scenes, right? And if you remember what we said at the beginning, most people don't like an outwardly selfish person. A lot of times they don't see the person that's being inwardly selfish. But the thing is, the second son was not humble at all either. His false humility actually exposed, was exposed by his anger and by his bitterness towards his father, the father who did not deserve any of this from his sons. The father in this passage had done nothing wrong at all. The second son thinks that by following the rules and by, by, by being good enough, that he'll obtain his inheritance, what his father's got left. But does this sound familiar to anybody? How many people do you know that honestly believe, well, if I do good enough works, I go to heaven? You ever heard that before? I would venture to say that most of us have in life. Are there some of you today, let's be honest, even Christians that go, well, I do a lot of good works. It's hard. It's great. We're proud of you. It's nothing compared to what God's done for us. But also, how many people do you know that have come and they've sat in row number three, pew number five, for the past 26 years? I put money in the plate every single time uh, that it's been passed to me. I've come to every soup supper that we've had. I've given somebody a muffin tin to help them out. Mmm, yeah, we're getting personal, aren't we, right? I've made coffee at the men's group for the past 27 years. I've done a lot of good things. Hate to tell you folks, it doesn't matter. It's great to do things when it's in love and when the action behind it is based in the love of God. The older brother within the context of the Bible is actually a picture of the Pharisees at the time, according to this parable. <clears throat> Pharisees did a lot of good things, a lot of it based on tradition, nonetheless. A lot of the tradition that when Jesus was here, it's not that it didn't mean anything, but Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to bring a new age to the children of Israel and then did the Gentiles as well. <clears throat> We're often doing good works for God and we kind of expect, expect his blessing, but we fail to grasp that the true blessing of knowing the Father's heart and love for us is being with the Father. We're supposed to be in a relationship with the Father, yet we fail to recognize the Father's actual heart. Be nice if we could only stop and recognize this characteristic. So we've talked about the two sons. Now we're going to look at the father. And this, sorry folks, but maybe the longest part of this message. The father in this story does represent our heavenly father who loves people, the believer and the non-believer alike. I also do believe that this father exemplifies to every single one of us what we are to be as parents. And this isn't just for young parents. This is for every parent here. This is even for people who aren't parents, right? Because you are called to minister. So you don't have to be a parent to minister. Maybe you teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you teach young kids. There's always somebody to minister to. Now look what the younger son says in the story in Luke 15, 17. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's men have food to spare. Now, these guys were not the children of the father because they had no right to any inheritance at all. These men were just hired people. But the father cared for them. The father loved them. Now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44 through 45. It says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Again, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. 
Make no mistake, God doesn't see it any different. He sees us equally. Our Heavenly Father has the heart for people, and He wants us to have a heart for people. I'm going to say this. Verlin, you have a heart for people. It's very evident. You know, what's the Great Commission for every single one of us? It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All nations. Does he exclude anybody in there? Nope, not a single person. All nations. He doesn't base it by race, creed. He, he doesn't base it by anything, nationality. Nope, 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 nope. What we need to understand is that all mankind was created in the image of God. All humans were created in the image of God, even those that we might not agree with on certain things. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says, it is God's desire for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Again, we see the word all consistently. But I do think this is where we as Christians struggle sometimes. We're kind of short-sighted like the younger son. We want our comfort when we want it. We want it in our time, not in God's time. You know, I would ask people, are you scared to share the gospel of Christ? No, I'm not scared. Really? Okay. When was the last time God spoke to you and said, I want you to speak to this person? What was your excuse? Did you do it? If you did, praise God. Thank you very much. Or did you shy away? You may not say, oh, I wasn't scared. I just... What, you, what other excuse are you going to make? You know, I, I even went as far as in, in the notes that I wrote on the side of my paper, I even put, are you prejudiced? I don't want to talk to that person because that dude's wearing a dress. I don't want to talk to that person because they're different. They're not approachable. God did not put a stipulation on you sharing the gospel. God did not put a stipulation on you caring for those people. God has a heart for people's eternities. And we're going to have a hard time being in close relationship with God if we can't understand his heart. The Father's heart. I've spoken about it a lot this morning already. Um, but as individuals and as parents alike, we need to understand and experience the heart of God. If in your life you've had a true revelation of the mercy and grace of God, then this is the Father's heart. After all, why wouldn't we want to pass this on to other people? Our children, or whomever it is. Everybody's made in the image of God. Our children are made in our image. Why wouldn't we want to pass that on? Now, the father in this parable is no ordinary man, but he had a heart for his children. In Luke 15, 20, it says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. His father was looking for his lost and wayward son. He was looking for him. He didn't just go, oh, there he's coming down the road. See what he's got to say this time. Nope, 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 nope. The father saw him a long way off and he ran. Again, let's look at the time period. If he was a father, if he had anything, which he had hired servants, he apparently had a lot of wealth. This guy wouldn't have actually been able to run very easily in what he was wearing. He would have had something that draped all the way down, almost touching the ground. To run, he would have had to physically pick that up and run. And in that time, if he was any man of social status, running would have been something he wouldn't have done. He would have had somebody else run and do it. In fact, you can see within the Bible many times that somebody that was of a greater social status, what did they do? They sent someone. Right? They did. But this guy, he had such a passion for his children. 
Even after all his son had done, he had taken his inheritance, which really wasn't his to take at the time. He had blown every bit of it. He had squandered every single penny. He had made a mockery of his name, his reputation, and perhaps forever scarred his family and his father for what he had done. But how does his father repay him? Verse 22, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He didn't just say, welcome back. He put the best of the best on his son. When he says he took, he took a robe and put it on his son, it would have been his father's robe. That would have been the best in the house. He took his ring, which would have been his father's ring because it was the best in the house. A fatted calf would have literally fed a small village at that time. That was a big deal. This was unheard of. You notice what he didn't do, though. He didn't shame his son. He didn't ridicule him. He didn't guilt trip the son for what he had done. He didn't beat him. He could have. He didn't public humiliate him. He didn't degrade him. In fact, I'd venture to say this father did every single, lo- every single aspect of love that's in 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read from the King James. So you can substitute the word charity for love if you like. But it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. That father, he did not have to one single iota love that son. He did not have to show him love and compassion and forgiveness. He had every right to say no. But he wanted to. He was excited and he was joyful that his son had returned home. just as the heavenly father is excited when one of his children returns home. After all that the heavenly father in Christ has given to us, he gives even more. Just when we don't deserve more mercy, he gives more mercy. Just when we deserve to die in the pit of despair and the filth and the degradation which we have caused, he gives it all again. And he does it joyfully with a happy heart, with a smile on his face. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that there's not consequences for what we do. Even though the son was welcomed back into the home and well-received by the father, he still squandered his inheritance. After everything that happened, the son still had to face that music because he had nothing. Everything that was father that owned from here on out was now the other sons. Things would never be the same. But the son still had life. He had the grace of the father. He had the love of the father. And he finally, finally after all this, could begin to understand the heart of the father. I want to say that this is what the Father, our Heavenly Father, does for us. He lifts us up when we're humble. When we come to Him and say, God, I am not worthy to be called your child. I do not deserve your love. I don't deserve your mercy. I don't deserve your grace. And by far, I do not deserve your forgiveness. God is looking for us. He wants us to come home. He wants us to realize that we can never do anything to work our way into heaven either. Nothing. None of the ways these boys chose was going to make them any better of a person. It wasn't. Both of the sons were working towards their inheritance. When in reality, guess what? 
It was only and ever the fathers to give. They had no right to it in any way. It was always the fathers. It's the, it's the important fact that it wasn't the physical inheritance, but it was the heart of the father. It was his love that made all the difference in the world. He loved his children and he accepted them even when they did not deserve it. So today, are you one of those children? Are you a selfish person, either outwardly or inwardly? Are you trying to work your way there? Maybe you think, whatever I do, that's going to get me there. Maybe I can fool people. Maybe I can look really good. You're not fooling God. You know, maybe it's another question. What will it take to make you humble in the sight of God? What will it take to bring you back to his never ending love and into his embrace? He is waiting for you. He is looking for you. And after everything we've done, guess what? He wants you to come home. He's ready. Are you? As we um, get ready to sing the invitation, I just want you to consider these things today. Um, like I said, this message was heavy on my heart because it is something to be humble before God. I've been there. All right, let's see.